and today we have advocacy for introverts, advocacy for extroverts, how you can make a difference in trying times with Betsy Adamowski and Keith Michael Fields. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to kick off uh, the session and talk a little bit about the goals, uh, and then uh, Betsy and I will introduce ourselves. Uh, so, uh, Cindy, if you can give me the second slide there. This is the first thing we're practicing. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there she is. Okay, good. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, the goals are to um, help you as a participant to understand what advocacy is, uh, that it happens at all levels, uh, to understand why it's important now, um, to talk a little bit about your library message and then how that message gets amplified through stories, uh, and then understand that you can be a powerful advocate no matter what you do at your library. Uh, and then uh, hopefully um, point, uh, give you some ways to start and walk uh, and talk your leadership role. Uh, when we talk about understanding uh, advocacy, um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about it at the highest level so that you have the theoretical framework that governs advocacy from the international level down to your little town. Um, but um, as I say, we're going to then come from there all the way down to specific tips uh, that you can use uh, when you uh, walk out of the uh, webinar door this afternoon. Um, we, the notion of walking and talking the leadership role, uh, we understand that uh, you're a part of reaching forward because you want to do better, you want to be better. Uh, and uh, we think that advocacy is a great opportunity uh, to, dis uh, to uh, demonstrate your leadership potential. Uh, and again, we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we um, go through the session. Um, this was designed originally uh, as part of the Reaching Forward face-to-face -face conference uh, as one of four sessions uh, that Betsy and I have been working on with the Advocacy Committee and uh, Cindy and Diane uh, to establish uh, an ongoing advocacy training program for Illinois uh, librarians, uh, trustees, and, um, uh, and friends. Um, the content doesn't change because of the situation we're in now. Uh, obviously, uh, with the coronavirus, uh, closed library buildings, uh, this affects our specific strategies. Uh, but we're hoping that the things we're talking about, uh, you'll be able to see, are just as relevant in good times as they are in bad times. Um, as far as questions go, uh, we're going to be adding about an additional 15 minutes at the end of the session so that we'll have plenty of time to talk about questions. Um, feel free to submit them in the Q&A as we go along. Uh, Betsy and I will be passing the microphone back and forth, hopefully smoothly, uh, and uh, that uh, at the end of each of our sections, uh, Cindy will see if there are any questions so we can take a few questions as we go along, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end too if there are other questions. Um, we're assuming for purposes of this that you're all frontline staff members and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, but we also need to tell you that this is the first time that Betsy and I have ever worked together, uh, either in person or, uh, you know, on Zoom. Um, so uh, the, uh, we're uh, hopefully will be smooth and entertaining, uh, but uh, please be kind to us. Uh, so uh, next slide. Take it, Betsy. All right. So we wanted to, uh, first of all, um, it, hello, everybody, um, and welcome to this Reaching Forward um, presentation. As Keith said, this is my first time doing a presentation such as this one um, with Keith. So again, yes, be kind to us. Um, so with that, a little bit about ourselves. Who are we and why, why are we qualified to do, to do this topic? Uh, that is one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most important topics that we can possibly do for our industry right now. So um, I will tell you, I have 31 years of library service. I, I've worked in multiple different types of libraries. Um, I've worked in the small library, um, and I've also worked in the large library where I'm at right now. So I certainly feel qualified to talk to both, uh, both audiences of a small library as well as a, a, a good, strong, uh, large or medium-sized library. I uh, I'm currently the executive library director for the Wheaton Public Library. I was the past library director for the Itasca Community Library for 15 years. 
been here in Wheaton for the last six years. I was also the past, past advocacy chair for the Illinois Library Association, as well as the um, past Illinois Library Association president. While I was the president, um, advocacy was definitely in the forefront of my, my platform. I, um, I have been the author of the uh, advocacy toolkit, which you can find on the Illinois Library Association website. And I've also been the instrumental in the legislative meetups and currently chair the Oak, uh, Oak Book one. So I certainly feel I'm, I'm a bit qualified to be able to do this presentation, but learning every single day. In fact, in just the last 20 minutes, I got thrown something. So advocacy is something I'm learning every second. So uh, between the two of us, you and me, uh, we're learning in this presentation once again. Go for it, Keith. Okay, great. Um, I, um, as you probably have guessed, I'm the other speaker. I'm Keith Michael Fields. Uh, I'm currently retired, having served for 15 years as director of the American Library Association. Uh, at ALA, uh, as you know, we were responsible for uh, working as part of our Washington office in terms of federal legislation for libraries, federal funding for libraries, uh, and in addition, we're very active at international uh, advocacy to see. Um, in addition, over the course of the 15 years I was at ALA, I probably did 200 uh, presentations uh, in almost every state in America on advocacy to local uh, chapters uh, around the country. Now, before coming to ALA, I spent 10 years as director of the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, uh, which is uh, essentially the state librarian for Massachusetts. Uh, and over the course, uh, when I first came to Massachusetts, since 11 libraries have been closed due to funding cuts as a result of a recession there. Uh, so we started out in a very difficult position uh, and built an advocacy effort there. Over the course of the decade, we were able to secure $500 million in new funding for libraries. Uh, I believe that's about $2,000 an hour um, in state funding. Uh, and part of it was uh, that we were able to undertake construction of about 200 uh, main libraries, uh, public libraries in Massachusetts. Uh, as part of this, uh, it meant uh, a lot of work with local libraries uh, that ranged from the Boston Public Library with a half million people that served a half million people, all the way to Gosnold, uh, a little island off the coast of Cape, coast of Cape Cod with 98 people uh, that had to uh, uh, get a bond issue passed in order to uh, uh, expand the building there. So a lot of experience in working with libraries of all types. Okay, enough about us. Now, one of the disadvantages of this format is we don't get to know a lot about you, and that we do apologize for, uh, but we hope that we'll be running into you many times in the future as we're active advocates. So now, uh, Betsy, I'm turning it back to you. Yeah, okay, all right, so. You know, I, I'm going to um, I'm going to fully disclose to you that um, when I, I was about maybe 15 years ago, um, there was one point of my library career that, quite frankly, the word advocacy just kind of scared me to death. You said advocacy and I just fell apart. I didn't really know uh, what it meant. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know uh, what to do with it. I really didn't. Um, so I started to, at that point, started to really look at it closely. And that's when I got myself involved in the Illinois Library Association and the Advocacy Committee in order to, uh, to strengthen my skill set and, and actually understand it. And what I really found out was that um, advocacy wasn't that scary. I, I was already doing it. I just didn't realize I was doing it. And I think that before we even go further into this presentation, I think it's really important that we understand what advocacy is and what it is not, because sometimes that gets a little confusing. Now, no matter what level you are in your library, um, this is critical because if you you cannot mess this up, especially if you're if you're if you're going on the ask for something, it's important that you distinguish. So I'm gonna first of all I'm gonna explain I'm gonna I'm gonna state what the definition is. So advocacy is defined as an action that speaks in favor of, recommends, argues for a cause 
supports or defends on behalf of others. So it is educating, it's organizing, it's nonpartisan, that's very important. It's evaluating, collaborating. Advocacy is educating a cause and giving reasons to why we'll make a difference. It is not lobbying. So lobbying is when you're telling somebody how to vote, telling them to say yes or to say no. Advocacy is educating them to get to an educated conclusion for that purpose. So an example would be, um, you would say, um, you know, we need, we need additional funding for our library. It's very important because you may then use some statistics, use some studies, use some what have you that you have as to why you need that additional funding. At Wheaton Public Library last year, I had to do this um, in, 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 a lot, in a huge way because I, I wanted to open the library uh, Sundays all year round. Um, and it wasn't a matter of me saying, I just want to open libraries, open Sundays because it's good. That's not good enough. I needed to do almost a year, line, a year wide um, study. I had to ask the community what they wanted. I had to look at my statistics. I had to look at the funding, and once I got all that in my, in my corner, then I was able to say, opening on Sundays all year round is important because, and here is why. So advocacy, remember, it's an action, it's engaging, it's supporting a cause, it's leading. It is not lobbying, it is not selling, it is not advising, it's, it's not marketing, and it's not begging. So as we go into this, make sure that you remember that. And um, so I'm going to then, um, I wish this is where I would say, is there any questions? But we don't have that luxury. So uh, with that, I think we could just continue on with, with advocacy as our topic, now that you have an understanding of what it is and what it is not. Next slide. OK. Uh, what you see before you is a thing uh, that uh, I call the advocacy continuum. And what it uh, tries to do is to show how the different pieces of advocacy um, flow together. Uh, and um, it really is very much like a stream uh, in that uh, you have uh, the, uh, the springs from which the stream flows uh, and all the way down to the tumultuous waterfall and rapids uh, of things like budget threats and challenges and whatever. So uh, I, I want to just go through this because it, it talks about some of the pieces we're going to talk about next uh, that you as an advocate um, uh, can be involved in and, and uh, need to think about. First of all, uh, the part that we call laying the groundwork. Uh, this is what happens before anything happens. Uh, it's, uh, it involves community engagement, it involves uh, being active in the community, uh, it involves building relationships, uh, it involves uh, having data. Uh, you need to make sure that you have statistics that you need in order to support something, as Betsy said, uh, opening on Sunday. Uh, you need, uh, but then in addition to uh, data, you also need personal stories. And these are two of the things we're going to talk about uh, in the next couple of minutes. So laying the groundwork is very, very important. Uh, the next step in the continuum is to put, uh, turning the support uh, into action. Uh, and this involves such things as training, uh, training, for instance, such as we're doing today, uh, resources uh, and measures, messages. Um, so the question is, what are our basic messages? Uh, what are the resources that we're developing so that people who are going to advocate on behalf of libraries uh, have them available? Uh, and then building support networks. Uh, this is the part where you start reaching out to friends groups, to uh, allies within the community, uh, within the state. Um, then at the next level, uh, we have what's called, um, is advocating for specific goals. And this occurs at every single level, beginning with your local uh, library. Uh, and again, uh, that's whether it's a public library, a school library, an academic library, or a special library, uh, you have uh, a local community that you serve. Uh, it also 
uh, involves goals at the state level, uh, whether it's legislation, increases in state funding, uh, support for state programs that make it easier for libraries to do their job. And then similarly, at the federal level, such things as federal funding, federal legislation. And then even at the international level, things like the uh, International Treaty on uh, library services to the blind uh, is something that at this point is, is currently uh, people are working on throughout the country in order to increase access to materials for the uh, for people who are uh, blind and uh, otherwise uh, visually disabled um, so whether the goals are local goals we'd like to be open on Sunday, uh, we would not like to have our budget cut, uh, or international goals. Uh, it's the same issue of, uh, of, um, uh, of specific goals. Last uh, but not least, you also have unexpected bad things that happen, budget threats, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, that because I think uh, that certainly is a factor in our future. Legislative challenges uh, and even censorship challenges all depend on laying the groundwork, turning support into action, and then advocating for specific goals. So this advocacy continuum is the framework within which uh, we're gonna now focus on a couple of pieces that uh, are particularly uh, important uh, to you as uh, potential advocates at the local level. All yours, Betsy. Okay, all righty. So um, now we can take a little bit of a step back here. And, um, and as we look at the next couple of slides, we're gonna look at what's currently happening to us right now. Um, and I know we're all dealing with a lot, um, especially with the governor's uh, latest Stay at home order extension last night. Actually, I he's already thrown me off a little bit. We this presentation just keeps shifting and shifting and shifting every time we we go to get it together, something else shifts. So I think that what we need to look at right, right now is all of us together, we're all in this together. No matter what level we are, no matter who we are within our organization. I don't know who's in our audience. We, we probably have some directors. We, have, we might have some trustees. Um, we might have some, um, you know, some shelvers. I don't even know who we have, but I can, all, I can honestly say we are in this together. And what we're doing is important and the advocacy that we are doing is critical more now than ever before. So looking at this list, which we changed, um, just got changed a couple of weeks ago, we definitely know that all our library buildings have been closed. And because they're closed, it doesn't mean that we get to curl up in a ball and just forget about it. We need to continuously now more than ever remind our leaders that libraries are essential. Even though we've been labeled non-essential, we still can provide essential services to those who are essential. So we are currently, and we continue to provide lots of important virtual services. We are doing virtual reference. Most of us are, I can't speak for everybody, but most of us are doing virtual reference service. We're doing, uh, we're doing um, digital data, downloading digital data. We are doing, um, we're certainly doing, um, you know, virtual programs and story times and so forth. While we're doing all that, we're also preparing for when we reopen. And when we reopen, that's when I think our essentialism is really gonna come into play. We are gonna be the first responders to those who need help, those who need access to, their, to the funding sources that they need to reach out for. We need to give them the authoritative information that they need. And we need to make sure that we have the right educational materials in our hands if they have to do for whatever it is that they have to do. We all know that the closing of the schools has definitely created a massive education gap. We as libraries with our virtual services have been a lifeline to our teachers and to our students by providing these virtual programs, by providing the uh, virtual story times. We definitely have had to probably even try to help with the, uh, the lessening of the digital divide and being able to hopefully serve our unserved. Now, I know this could be 
a touchy topic for some of us, but at the Wheaton Public Library, I took the initiative to make sure that all of our residents within our school district have the ability to get a library card, whether they are the resident or they're a non-resident. In the last three weeks, we registered over 500 library cards so that we make sure that every student and every teacher who is able to get into our system and be able to be, use our materials within their curriculum needs. We have also been a resource for our small local businesses. Just the other day, I got a frantic email from somebody who couldn't get a hold of the, their Chase representative and wanted to know if I had a connection. Could I help them? And so through me, knowing people at the chamber, knowing people from the Downtown Wheaton Association, we were able to connect this person to somebody from Chase. So the economic impact of COVID-19 means, uh, it will mean a very difficult times ahead of us and how we're going to continue to address that and how we're gonna be continuing to be a resource, a community resource to our community needs to be broadcast to our leaders, to our, our, our whoever it is that's running your town or your city. You need to make sure that they understand that we're gonna be essential. We're gonna be an essential community resource, a communication resource, an authoritative resource. Libraries need to clearly communicate their critical role in our economy because I really do believe that we are going to be one of the keys to get our economy rolling again. Now is not the time to be cutting staff. Now is not the time to be for lowing staff. But if we have done that, then we need to make sure that we have time to bring those staff back and we give ourselves time to re, re, uh, bring them back up to speed and to do the necessary webinars and so forth, so that when we do open and we do become that resource, we're ready to go. So advocacy is more important now than ever. And again, I'm gonna look at my notes because I wanna make sure that I don't miss anything uh, before we go into, into the next one. All right, so I think I'm ready to turn into the next one, which goes into the next is, why are you an important advocate for your library right now. No matter what level you are, you are a vital resource and advocate to your library. You are the person who knows what your community needs. You may be a parent with a child who is maybe, I don't know, doing a calculus class. You have no idea how to help that student, but you certainly would know what the library has in order to help your child. And then you can be the one to advocate that to your neighbors and to your family so that they know what the library has. You know what your library can do right now. You know how to download those books. You know how to find the information. Be the advocate to whatever church, whatever group, wherever it is that you're out there doing and make sure that they also know the more people that know the more the, the stronger our library message will be both you and your library exist within a larger community and you have a place in there somehow and it even can be when you're standing in line at the jewel and you i don't know somebody says something about you know oh i don't want to touch the magazines uh, you could say well hey you can download it on your on your iPad and and that and don't spend the money use use your use uh use your library. You know how your library can fit within that larger community or organization right now. So um I I also wanted to state that um, some of you may also be participating in a larger role within your food pantries or um and, and I'm gonna use an example where one of my board members was brilliant because he, his daughter was volunteering at the local food pantry here in Wheaton and they ran out of bags. And he knew that the library had 1,000 census bags that we were planning on giving out on April 1st. Of course, we never got to do that. He contacted me, he said, hey, would you mind if we come over and grab those 1,000 bags and we can start packing our food in those? It was a dream come true. I never would have thought of it. Not only did we have those bags to give, we knew we had other bags on our hands to be able to give from past summer reading programs. You may have something in your library that can be critical right now. Your 3D printers are also coming, could go into action. 
to help maybe uh, build some of their PPE that they need so, so uh, desperately right now for their masks. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay. So um, now, how do you do all that? I just threw a lot of information at you. I, I wish I had you in front of me so I can kind of see your faces um, and see some hands going up, but I'm just gonna push forward. The next slides are kind of my favorite slides, I'll be honest with you. As a leader in the community, I tend to talk a lot about, um, about your role that you play in being in the know, being the leader, walking and talking the library. So um, as we shift a little bit here, um, you now know why advocacy is important. You know why you are important. Now you need to know Oh, you can strengthen, your, strengthen yourself even more. You should take the time to look at your library's mission, know what the library's mission is, make sure you believe in it, make sure you can support it. You also should look at your library's strategic goals. And I know not everybody has them, but some of you have some really good ones. Ask what the strategic goals are of the library. You also should get yourself on e-lists, so that you know what's going on in the world, especially right now with the, in the American Library Association, Illinois Library Association, Rails, Heartland, Illinois, Library, uh, Illinois State Library, they all have listservs that you can get onto. You should be reading your library board packets. You should be watching your minute, you're watching your board meetings if they're online or, or reading, uh, reading, about, um, the, reading the minutes every month. You should be learning about your patrons and know the community that you serve. At the Wheaton, uh, Wheaton Public Library, we're really just embracing this LGBTQ population and we're really, we're really going all out for it. I'm so excited about it. And I think you need to make sure, do you have the materials and so forth to support that? Read your local newspaper. Know your community. Who are your community leaders? Who are you movers and shakers? In Wheaton, we have a very active Rotary Club and a very active, active Lions Club. I'm on both of those. If you have those and no one from your library is in those organizations, you should join. Who are your key businesses? Uh, we have a downtown Wheaton Association. We have a chamber. I'm a member of both. And also my community engagement is involved. Your school curriculum, you should know your curriculum. Does your, does your collection match your curriculum? and so on. I can go on and on. And your listservs in your community and so forth. You need to know not only your library, you need to know how your library will fit into the community. Therefore, you need to know the community. It goes, it goes, to, it goes twofold. Um, all right, let's move to the next slide. All right, okay. So now that you kind of know what your library is and you know what your community is, where do you fit? How are you a leader? And how are you maybe not even a leader, but a follower? And I always say followers are just as important as the leaders. What church are you involved in? You know, are you on your PTA? Um, are you engaged um, in, in the community outside the library, like with the PTA or within your church or what have you? Are you serving as a leadership role somewhere? Are you on the board of your school? Um, if you are, there's, those are places in which you will be able to introduce the library into with what you are doing. So I already gave you the food pantry example. That's a great example. Um, and I also know that uh, I also speak highly of our, of our uh, People's Resource Center, which does computer training and um, education classes. Um, I make sure that the library has a connection with that and we partner. So, Basically, I can sum this up and say, are you, is your library serving as a vehicle in your community? Is it helping to drive your goals of your community? And then is your community helping you to drive the goals of the library? And that goes on any level of where you're at. The stronger you are within your library and what you know, and if you support it, the stronger you will be in your voice within your community. In order to do all that, you do need to know your mess, how to build your message. So I'm gonna leave that over to Keith. 
Fabulous, great. Um, so I think that uh, just to um, tie into what Betsy has just said, uh, everyone uh, today on this webinar um, has community connections that are unique. Uh, you may have children in the school system, uh, you may be a member of a church, you may be a member of a club, uh, but uh, every single person who works in the library has community connections uh, at the supermarket, uh, in their neighborhood, on their block, uh, that really represent uh, a unique opportunity to advocate. And that's why one of the points I think we uh, talked about in the goals is, is that, uh, everyone in the library is important. Uh, I certainly have seen in my um, past experience, um, you, you may have the director of the library, but the person who knows the mayor's sister's cousin through Little League is actually you. Um, so uh, I think uh, part of advocacy is uh, remembering that you have these connections to the community uh, and that you um, uh, look at your connections in the community uh, and realize that those are important connections. I think the other connection that uh, frontline staff has, and I think most uh, of the people here today uh, fall into that category, um, is, is that, uh, you know, the director may be trying to deal with the budget or trying to deal with the mayor or, or trying to deal with like the leaky roof. Um, staff are the ones who are interacting with uh, patrons and library users uh, more than anyone on a day-to-day -day basis in most libraries. So that's a real strength you bring. Okay, we've now talked about developing relationships and, and the important role that you play. Uh, I'm gonna now talk a little bit about messaging. Um, uh, let me start out with the big picture. Uh, and a lot of this uh, you may recognize from, uh, if you're familiar with the National Libraries Transform campaign, uh, there are some messages that apply to all libraries at all levels. Uh, libraries transform lives. Uh, they're not just places where people take out books. They're places where people undergo um, uh, deep uh, transformative experiences and uh, make their lives better. Uh, in the process, libraries also transform communities. I, I always used to say that a community without a library is just a bunch of houses. And that was something that people responded to. Um, you know, you can't just draw a circle around, uh, you know, a bunch of buildings and call it a community. Uh, a library really is at the heart of what makes, uh, the beating heart of what makes a community. Uh, libraries are not just passionate advocates for lifelong learning. I would go certainly beyond that and say the libraries are absolutely central uh, and a, a kingpin to it. Um, the number of people that use libraries to uh, do job work, to do research, to do homework, um, to uh, explore um, personal interests uh, to support uh, small businesses and startup businesses. Uh, it's just there's a thousand stories in every community. Um, the other thing that I think is is not well understood is that there are also the front line of access to government information that can be essential to survival. Uh, when Katrina shut down the libraries in New Orleans, uh, people were lined up at libraries throughout Louisiana, throughout Texas, throughout Alabama, waiting to use terminals to actually be able to access FEMA forms. Uh, so uh, part of what people don't realize is is that um, just because something's on the internet doesn't mean that people can actually use it. So many people come to the library because where else can you get a human being to help you to actually do something? This is going to be very, very important uh, as we start reopening because so many lives are going to need to be like uh, glued back together. Uh, so many businesses are going to need to uh, come back up. Uh, the uh, message that we've been talking about is, is that libraries are essential to a robust recovery. And if we're going to get back up again and get back to where we were before uh, from an economic standpoint, from an educational standpoint, uh, we're going to need libraries. And uh, that's good because libraries are a smart investment. Uh, they are probably the best expenditure of uh, tax funds uh, that you can imagine. Uh, they make uh, materials available to everyone who walks in the 
the door or doesn't walk in the door with virtual services uh, and, uh, and a, a very, very small amount of money. A library may represent a penny out of every dollar that goes into local tax support. Uh, and if you look at what's returned uh, on that, uh, libraries are an extremely smart investment. Um, uh, next slide. Now, I've just talked about some of the big messages, and I think these messages apply, uh, hopefully, to all of the libraries that you're involved with. Uh, but then the, we're going to now take it down the next level uh, and talk about your library story. Um, Betsy's talked a little bit about libraries in her community uh, and some of the special circumstances. Each one of you here today has a unique situation and some special circumstances. Uh, you may have uh, been trying to get open on Sunday uh, before this uh, happened. Uh, you're certainly going to be facing some very specific challenges uh, in your community uh, as we move to reopen. So I think uh, knowing uh, what's unique and special about your library? Do you have a really strong genealogy section? Uh, how are your small business services? Uh, what are the things that uh, really make your library uh, unique to your community? Uh, then what are the library's issues? Um, do you uh, need to be open in an evening when you're not open? Um, the next question is, what are your plans? Um, I'm assuming that in every instance, uh, the library uh, has been giving some thought to ways in which they can make services better. It may be additional technology, uh, it may be uh, facilities, uh, it may be hours, it may be staffing. Uh, so again, your library has a story. Um, and it's very important because at the bottom of this bulleted list, we talk about how this is going to make a difference in your community. And again, as Betsy said, we want to be open on Sunday. Great. Why do we be, want to be open on Sunday? What difference is that going to make? Now, where this really is critical now is that we know that when we reopen, uh, that municipal tax revenues are going to be down. Um, and this is going to have an impact because uh, in 2021, there's going to be uh, a lot of pressure uh, to reduce public expenditures as public revenues uh, become tighter. That's why the stories, uh, the messages, the stories, the relationships that you're currently building are going to be so important uh, because you have to be ready. If you look at that advocacy continuum, at some point, uh, bad things can happen to good people, and you need to have done the work uh, in order to be ready. Um, the best advocates for change are those people who can tell a story that moves people to action, and you're the one who knows those stories best, as Betsy was saying. You're the one who has community connections. I don't have them. Uh, nobody who writes an advocacy textbook has connections in your community. You have those connections. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this brings us to um, the uh, one of the key messages this afternoon, uh, and that is the whole notion of stories. Um, you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words, uh, and uh, certainly it's very important to know that 12,000 people attend uh, children's story hours each year. But what makes that number come alive is being able to tell the one story about the one person and how those story hours affected their life. So for instance, um, the, uh, this, and again, this is where you as a frontline uh, library uh, staff member have the opportunity to know this. Uh, again, uh, somebody uh, working on a budget in the back room that's your director, potentially you may be a director, uh, is not necessarily going to be the one who's going to hear the story that you're going to hear as you're working with a patron and finding out why it is they need internet access in order to find some information. So the whole notion of building a story is, give me a problem. Um, you know, uh, Jimmy is having problems uh, because he can't get his multiplication tables down. Give me a library intervention. Uh, or for instance, uh, my daughter's having problems uh, 
you know, starting reading. Give me a library intervention. She attends a story hour. Give me a happy ending. Now she's reading three books a day. Give me a fact. Did you know that there are 12,000 other kids that are benefiting in the same fashion? And then again, this is built around a real person. Uh, I know that when we would go and we would talk with, you know, Dick Durbin or Barack Obama when he was senator, uh, or um, when we uh, talked with people at the White House office, the ability to have data and at the same time to be able to tell that story was so important. You are uniquely positioned in your library to get those stories, but getting the stories is one thing you need to also make sure that you share them with other people so that these stories can be incorporated into the library's messaging and again going back a slide or two what are you trying to accomplish and what are the stories that are going to help to to make people understand uh, what it is that you're trying to do. Again, uh, Betsy talked about trying to be, uh, get open on Sunday. Uh, once you're open on Sunday, you're going to be able to tell thousands of stories about things that people were able to do. Uh, So-and-so had a job, they couldn't bring their kids to the library, but on Sunday, the whole family could come and they could do this and that and the other thing. And here's the difference that these things made uh, in terms of their family. So one of the things that uh, you can, and everybody working in a library or associated with a library can do, uh, is, to, is to be a conduit for these stories. I know that uh, when uh, ILA, uh, Diane Foote and, and Cindy Robinson are looking to talk about uh, state programs for libraries, they are always looking for stories. I know that when the people at the ALA Washington office are talking about federal funding for libraries or E-rate, they're you're looking for stories. You have the stories because you know the people, you're interacting with the people. <coughs> so the, uh, the point today is um, try and make sure that you provide a place for library patrons to uh, talk about their library experiences, to, to write their library experiences. Uh, we used to do contests in some of the libraries I worked with. Uh, tell us your library success story. Those stories were so valuable in helping us to make the case. Um, have photos taken if people are willing to give permission. Uh, and then uh, this is a great thing for social media to be able to regularly tell stories uh, about how um, about how um, libraries are impacting the lives of people. So now we're talking about then. Uh, remember, start documenting your Corona uh, story, virus stories now. Uh, a lot of people's lives are being affected by this. A lot of people are already using library virtual services, story hours, virtual reference services. Uh, in order to deal with situations, the number of these is going to increase dramatically. You are well positioned, perfectly positioned uh, to be able to have your thumb on the pulse and to be able to, um, to know these stories and to be able to share them. They are going to make a huge difference in your library's advocacy efforts going forward. Okay, and now without further ado, let's uh, pass it back to Betsy. Okay, um, so you got a lot of information in the last 45 minutes. Uh, Keith and I threw a lot at you. We know we did, but every piece is critical. And now you can take some action. I want to believe that almost all of us have been taking action from the day that we had to close our doors and then to the day that we get to possibly do some curbside service or we get to start letting people come back in the library, which I hope happens, but it's not gonna be for a while yet, I'm sure. We need to start taking action, and if you haven't started taking action, now is the time, it's not too late, you can get started. So start by understanding your library. So your library right now is in a weird place. The building's not open, but, and we can't see library service, but we know library service is there. So start by understanding what's going on within your library virtually. Stay current on the issues that are going on. The governor just gave his presentation that yesterday. If you didn't get to see it, by all means, you can. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. 
go in and listen to what he had to say. The key thing he said was that curbside can start for retail. And immediately, does that mean us? What does that mean? How will it affect the library? What is this gonna happen? And how are we gonna go forward? You should also be considering participating in training that will allow you to channel your knowledge about your library and its, issue, and its issues into your actions. My staff, 100% has been working from home. They have been, they've been doing webinars. They have been learning. Um, my business, my reference staff, my business librarian has been trying to learn as much as they can to help those business, uh, those businesses, um, either to 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 continue or maybe even to exit out. They they are going to need some authoritative help. So my staff has been positioning self to be that person. Um, you uh, you want to work within your comfort zone, but think sometimes about stepping outside of it. I have staff members with, my, with some guidance from my, uh, on my end. They are now trying their hand at making the masks for when the staff go back to work. Um, and also, I, you also need to know that whatever it is that you're doing, you're letting somebody know that you're doing it, that you're working on it, you're taking some classes, you're doing what you, what you need to do. I have one staff member that took it upon himself to write some guidelines on the 3D printer, and we did not ask him to do that. He did that on his own. It's fabulous. But those key pieces, no matter how small or how large, are all part of advocacy. And the key, the very first step is the mission. What is the mission of the library? And what are you doing to support that mission? And everything that we've been doing has been supporting our, our strategic goals. So stop, look at that, and then start to take action. You start by looking at your mission and then your strategic goals, and then what it is it that you, you can do with that uh, within your library. Um, I have one other minute and I was going to use an example, which is a really bad example, but I don't care. I'm using it. It's another, uh, another crisis that we dealt with um, earlier in the year and that's the act of shooters, which I know COVID-19 act of shooters. But this is so critical because we were doing active shooter training in the schools. And while that was great, I took it upon myself to go before the, uh, the city and, the, and say, wait a minute, what about all the people who don't have kids in school? When am I going to get trained? How am I going to know how to act when I'm in, you know, in church or at the jewel or what have you? And so from there, we took that active shooter training into the on a community level, and we did a series of training within the library for our community members. So sometimes you have to think outside the box a little bit, and sometimes they, we have to let our community know that there's a whole other audiences in our community. It's not just the schools. Um, so sometimes you just have to think a little bit uh, stronger and then take some action and voice your uh, voice your what your concern or what is it that the library can do. So no matter what level you are, you absolutely can do this, especially now. We need you now more than ever with this COVID and when we start getting back. I need to know, I know I need to know from my staff what are their concerns because if they're having a concern, that means somebody else is, and then somebody else is within the community. So um, anyway, I think that this is so critical, and I hope that I'm conveying uh, this is, is, as well as I can. And you have a role to play, and I hope you do it well. All right. OK, so now we have come to uh, what I think is, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, practical uh, and uh, things that you can do right away, uh, you know, this afternoon, tomorrow morning uh, at dawn when you get up. Um, so uh, we have a, a piece here, which is a handout. Uh, hopefully uh, you've had a chance to see it, but if you haven't, uh, you know, you need to just uh, rush and, and print it out. Uh, it's called uh, 23 Advocacy Things, Tips for Frontline Employees. Uh, this was done uh, in a number of years ago. Uh, by when Camilla Alire was the ALA president, and her focus was on 
frontline advocacy, uh, which is to say, uh, what are the real people, that's you, who work in libraries with patrons, uh, how can you actually be uh, effective advocates and be more effective advocates for, uh, for your library? Um, so uh, it's got 23 uh, tips, uh, and uh, there's some interesting uh, tips here. Um, the, um, Again, a lot of these are very specific situations uh, and, and you can see how they uh, make sense at your library. So uh, what we thought we would do at this point is, uh, Betsy and I are each gonna share one or two of our favorites uh, from this 23 advocacy tips. Uh, and this is just to show how you take uh, the advocacy continuum and the structure we've talked about, uh, things like building relationships, uh, leveraging your own strengths within the community, uh, understanding and working on the message development, uh, and then uh, gathering stories uh, in order to be uh, an effective part of your advocacy team. Um, so I'm going to then let uh, Betsy will pick one or two, uh, and then I'll pick one or two, just uh, sort of as a, a wrap up to kind of uh, show you uh, what's in this wonderful uh, handout. Okay. All right. Thanks, Keith. Um, you know, I think that I have, um, I've given some um, examples throughout this presentation that kind of fall in this, but um, the, the first one, um, Know Your Library's Issues. Um, and obviously we know um, in Illinois, we do have an issue with the unserved. And so I definitely, uh, I wanted to pick on this one just a little bit because while we all struggle with our unserved and know that we have pockets of, of, of areas in our community that are not getting a library card. And I certainly understand that you pay for a library card and you, you don't give away free library cards. But this was a one that kind of came up and, and, uh, uh, and my team, when my team came together when we closed the library, because we realized, oh my gosh, we have an issue here. We have an issue of a lot of students, but not a lot, but a, a majority of students within our school district that are not gonna be able to ac access our digital uh, our, our databases and our virtual, um, uh, actually I should say our digital content, maybe that's a better word. Um, and with that, we have a problem because we're advocating to the community that we have this content and that teachers can use it and so forth. So the issue is, is what do we do? So we took it upon ourselves to immediately with the youth services department and my adult services department, and we looked at our, you know, the rest of our staff members in there, and we said, well, what, what, what if we just give everybody a library card for a temporary time, and we just go forward with that? And so um, we did. We we built a, a weird little quick model, and we have since registered over 500 library cards. They're temporary, and it's only for digital content. But here we made sure that all of our staff members, I have right now I have 68 on my, on my um, payroll, all 68 of them were aware of what we did, why we did it, and then they were supporting of it as to why we did it. Even though I sometimes giving away something free is a little hard for me, but I really believed in it and my board really believed in it and my staff really believed in it. And we have seen the results of that because we have definitely narrowed the digital divide within our community and all of our students in our, in our school district are getting the important um, library services that they need right now in this time of crisis. So that number one was my favorite. So Keith, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and do, do yours because I know time is short. Okie dokie. Um, so uh, one of the ones that I uh, find uh, most uh, abusing is uh, number five, uh, which is uh, Camilla calls recognizing fine wine when you see it. Um, and um, it, it, uh, it's based on the fact that frontline employees typically have standardized communication with patrons, uh, exchanges at the task in hand, do you have your library card, you know, blah, 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 uh, as well as banter about the weather. Uh, but um, the, um, one of the things is that your interactions uh, are very, very critical. Uh, and uh, this is where uh, Camilla has to find the fine wine. Uh, so uh, a patron says, I noticed the city's budget was cut. How is the library budget? 
frontline employee says, oh, we never get anything. They always cut us first. They have something against us. Eh. Okay, so that is a fine wine. So I, I think uh, the point here is that we all know uh, as we interact with other um, organizations, with other businesses, with other people on the phone, uh, that um, a lot of the uh, image uh, and the message that's portrayed by that organization uh, it comes through uh, in the interactions on a day-to-day -day basis. And you are the ones who actually control and dominate those interactions. I think all of us have had the experience of showing up in a business where the person at the desk or on the phone is not happy to be there and uh, makes that very clear to you. Um, I think we all need to look at our own daily interactions uh, and make sure that we're doing everything we can. Uh, so for instance, um, the uh, alternative to the fine wine that we just heard is, yeah, we did have cuts. I know the managers are working as to how we're gonna deal with them. Thanks for asking. We always need support. Here's a brochure uh, talking about ways in which you might help the library. So again, um, Every situation can be turned into an opportunity, even the daily uh, interactions uh, that, uh, that uh, we may do hundreds or even thousands of times. Um, I, I think the other one is the last one, and that is uh, saying thank you. Um, you know, thanks for coming in. Thanks for using the library. Uh, keep using the databases. Uh, I know when you've got like a, a string of people waiting and irritated because they want to check their books out. Um, but I think again, uh, the degree to which the interactions of uh, you and those of us who directly interact with patrons uh, do so much to set. Uh, we talk about laying the groundwork in the advocacy continuum. That groundwork is laid every day, thousands of times uh, by you as you interact with patrons. So um, I, I think at this point that we are ready for our last slide, right, Betsy? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the point being that uh, there is, there's a lot to read, there's a lot to learn. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to join the two of us uh, and for breaking us into this webinar thing. Um, we, um, I think your interest in advocacy is an important step. Uh, I hope that you'll participate in additional training, uh, that you'll share uh, what you've learned or, or what, uh, uh, what you think uh, you've learned uh, with other people and encourage others to be active advocates. Because in order for libraries to be successful, it can't just be the trustees, it can't just be the director, uh, it can't just be a few people, uh, it can't just be important people, uh, it has to be everyone in order for the library to be as, um, as effective in its advocacy. Uh, and as successful as it can be. Um, so um, I, I think other than, uh, we're gonna go to Q&A now, and I hope somebody has like some really, you know, we wanna do like a, a, a White House press conference thing here, bring on the <laughs> tough questions. Um, and we promise we'll do a, a real good job too. Uh, please uh, let us know uh, in any follow-up uh, how we can do better. Uh, are there things we could have covered more of or the things we could have covered less of? Um, uh, we're very much interested. Uh, Betsy and I are kind of working single-handedly to try and get up uh, a regular program of, of training uh, so that uh, there are a half dozen opportunities during the year at various ILA and other events uh, for people to get training. Um, and, uh, you know, we do uh, hope we'll be able to bring other people in because, um, you know, we just as soon, you know, sit around and have other people do all the hard work. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, again, uh, please let us know how we can do better. Now, we have come to that point in which uh, does any, are there any questions? Uh, and uh, if so, we could, you know, try and, and answer them. Uh, any thoughts? Anything we've missed, you know? Is anyone out there? <laughs> hey, okay, great. Thank you, Margarita. That is exactly the attitude. Thank you. <laughs> 
No questions. Oh. Aha, take it. Okay, so I, I think she was asking about introverts and extroverts and the tips that we can, um, the tips that uh, for extroverts and ext introverts is that, I think that was what she was asking. This is so difficult, but I, I, I'll just kind of broaden on that. Um, yep. Okay, good. All right, um, I'll just kind of mention that. You know, I, um, I'm going to say that sometime now, now this is very really touchy because some people are very touchy about being an extrovert versus an introvert. And um, I will say that some of our best advocates are our introverts are the ones who, and you wouldn't think that, you would think you need the rah, rah, the cheerleader, the woo, 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 those. But what's so critical in the advocacy is listening, it's taking a step back and listening. And I think those who put yourself in that definition as an introvert are our best advocates. They listen, they, they pay attention, they articulate the information, they count to 10 before they speak versus people like me, sometimes I'm my worst enemy because I speak too fast, I jump too fast, I go too fast. And so on my bench of my leadership, I have my introverts who really, I really pay attention to them. So that's why I think I love this to topic and we, we didn't get to talk about it as much as we would have wanted to. Um, but I, I really do think that introverts are so critical. Advocacy is not a cheerleading opportunity. Advocacy is listening and articulating your message and doing it calmly and doing it slowly and making sure you do it in the right time and the right place. I don't know, Keith, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I saw a question about staff morale. And uh, you know, part of it is, the fact of the matter is uh, it's tough not to feel you know discouraged um you know you're frustrated because you're kind of on the sidelines and you'd like to uh, you know not be on the sidelines um I, I think the only thing i can emphasize is that your community is depending on you so you know we expect um people who work in hospitals to be brave um we all need to be brave because we are community leaders if we work at the library and so i think um talking about morale uh, hopefully uh the people that work in your library have an opportunity to um you know have a zoom session on a regular basis uh even if they're not um physically present. I think being honest about morale and sharing it and talking about ways, but, but remember you're together and that morale's not something that somebody else can do for you. So um, I, the only thing I can say is to remember that uh, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, uh, your community is depending on you. So, uh, you know, what do they say? Uh, you know, everyone's scared. What bravery is, is what you do next after that. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, we would encourage, uh, if you're feeling a little bit down, uh, talk with um, other people at the library about it. Uh, talk about ways in which you can feel better. I know a number of libraries that are doing virtual happy hours a couple of times a week, just to, to keep uh, people's spirits up uh, because everyone feels uh, so frustrated about what's happening. Um, the um, it's interesting. Uh, um, there's a couple of questions about uh, checking on older patrons and uh, older populations. Boy, we're interested. I think a library that has a program, uh, for instance, even uh, are, are there ways in which you can call uh senior patrons on a regular basis and let me put it this way uh, we're all looking for something to do because in fact we have less of the physical things that we're doing uh so i, I think it would be great to see some ideas um that where we could reach out to older people now again they've talked about people who don't have a computer and don't have internet and how do you service them with virtual services and i think the answer is uh, it, it's tough. I, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that thinking about that now uh, is going to be very, very, uh, very, very important. Um, 
one of the other questions is, uh, I think most people, with the exception of older uh, patrons, do have a telephone, so that a lot of people, even if they have smaller incomes, do have a handheld phone. Uh, I think trying to figure out ways that you can uh, at least communicate with people or deliver messages. Uh, very frequently, smaller income families, a smaller income family by definition, is going to have children. So they're going to have issues with education. So they're a, a particularly good audience for uh, anything coming through uh, mobile phone apps or cell apps uh, that might relate to educational opportunities or story hours. Again, um, you know, if you've got 2,500 libraries in Illinois, not everyone's going to be able to invent the wheel. Uh, but we've unfortunately got another like five weeks to work on this. So I do think that those are the questions that should be asked. And I think there are some uh, responses. And a lot of this, uh, we used to have a thing where, you know, everyone on the staff would call five people a month. Um, maybe some of those old fashioned chains might be a way of reaching out to people again uh, in uh, this situation. Yeah, I would like to just add to that, Keith, is that we, um, what we've been doing on our end, obviously it's a larger community, but because I uh, am with the Lions Club and the Rotary Club, you know, this is where the service organizations can come in handy for you. And basically it's just Wheaton Public Library, stay connected, you're not alone. So, you know, they can utilize our services and so forth from, uh, from their devices that they may have at home. They're not alone. And um, so that's just kind of a message that we've been kind of giving out to, um, to our, our individuals. I did a, a, I, I zoomed in on a, on a TED Talk and the girl that came in into the program, she's just like, I'm here all by myself. And, you know, it's just me. I haven't left my house. I've got this. I love these Zoom programs the library is doing because it's my one way to get face-to-face -face connection. So just something to think about. Yeah, and Betsy, I think your point, um, if you have a retirement uh, community, um, if you have organizations that work with older people, work through them because they've actually got the communication network to get information out. Uh, and that's something that, you know, you don't have to be uh, an expert in a particular thing to be a liaison. If you actually know of a group, um, you can really end up being a key person in this link with this other group and the group of uh, elderly people. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing, uh, employees are concerned that they'd be judged with some of the virtual stuff others are doing. Now, I think what I'm hearing in that question is, uh, if, if your, your library is not able to do a lot of virtual stuff, um, you know, uh, you don't want to be judged that you're, all I can say is, uh, again, you've got another five weeks to work on it. And I think anything that you can do that involves reaching out, whether to groups or to uh, uh, making services available to individuals, uh, try something small, you know, give it a shot, do a story hour, uh, do a book discussion, uh, a kind of a thing, do somebody talking about, uh, you know, new books that are available. Uh, and remember that with, um, things like the uh, uh, the uh, statewide ebook contracts and whatever. Uh, every library, no matter how small or what type of library, does actually have uh, can provide patrons with access to certain uh, certain kinds of electronic resources. So there's no limitations on that. Uh, and again you can be the one that makes people aware of them so that they can use them. Uh, again, we're kind of moving into service development, but certainly uh, a key to advocacy is, is having services that meet your community needs, as Betsy said, uh, and that that's the first, um, uh, you know, the first, uh, the first link. Uh, I remember working with a library once in New Jersey and we went in to consult with them and uh, discovered that the community was 80% Cuban and um, the library had like a hundred thousand books and there were like 200 in Spanish. So there are things that you can do at the service level that are going to make your advocacy job a lot easier. I think that's it. Thank you very much for the questions. <laughs>
All right, well, thank you, everyone. Remember, you are not alone during this time. You have all these associations you can reach out to if you haven't done so yet. Please go ahead and check it out. You'd be surprised how much information you, um, you have right in front of you. Um, and of course, Keith and I are, are around. Our emails are out there. You can email me any questions that you have or some concerns or what have you. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing you hopefully one day, maybe at the conference. Uh, in October. So good luck, everybody. Stay and safe. Th and thanks to ILA for making all of this happen. Thanks, Cindy. All right. Thank you so much, Betsy and Keith. This was a lot of information. And I know whether you're just starting out in libraries or have been in libraries like some of us for a long time, there were a lot of takeaways here. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, just a heads up for everyone, we will have another Reaching Forward Friday next Friday. May 1st, which was originally supposed to be Reaching Forward Conference Day, at 1 o'clock, we will have um, time management calendars and task lists. So if you're interested in attending that, please make sure to sign up on the ILA website. Um, thank you so much, and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.